Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, the program in uh, power system analysis. Uh, so this is Professor Uma Rao bringing you the lecture series under the ages of VTU e sectiona program. So in this session, I'm going to uh, discuss about uh, multi-machine stability. So we already saw what is the meaning of stability. So stability is the ability of a system to remain in synchronism. And in my previous lectures, we have seen about uh, how to evaluate the stability. So you can do it using equal area criteria in the simplest of cases. And we also saw the actual solution of differential equations. So for this, in a single machine in finite bus system, you can use the step-by-step -step procedure or you can uh, go for Range Kuta method, modified Euler's method, or any of the other numerical methods for solution. So in today's lecture, we will see how I can extend this concept to a multi-machine system. What are all the equations involved and how we go about solving them. Okay, let us see uh, some things. Okay, so let's just see what a multi-machine system actually looks like, right? So if you see your single machine in finite bus, it was like this. I have a single machine and it is connected to an infinite bus, right? Simple case. And here I, I have my simple equation. The mechanical power minus the electrical power is equal to the acceleration power. And we saw that the mechanical power is considered a constant. And the electrical power is simply evaluated as V, V1. That is the generator bus. If you have a generator bus here, this would be V1. Let us call this as V2. And let us call this as X. So X will involve the impedance of the generator winding, of the transformer, of the line, everything. So in, if I neglect the resistance, if I neglect the resistance, then simply I can write P is equal to V1, V2, sine delta 1, 2 by X. Okay, so delta 1, 2 is the phase angle difference between V1 and V2. And we solve for these two equations. That is the acceleration equal to PM minus PE. And for PE, I substitute V1, V2, sine delta 1, 2 by X. And uh, with this, we also have the swing equation md squared delta by dt squared is equal to pa. So we keep solving for this second order differential equation. Clear? Fine. So we saw all this in the previous lectures. Now let's see what happens in case of a multi-machine system. So I have a generator here. I have a generator. I'm just showing something illustrated randomly like this. And then each of them has an internal voltage and it has a terminal bus and in between you would have the impedance or the reactance of the generator winding and these are all connected in some fashion. This is what it is. Clear? Now, for every generator, so each of these generators are coupled to the prime mover, to their respective prime movers, right? Each of the generators are getting their input from their respective prime movers, 
right so if you take any generator any generator you will have the same swing equation this is the simplest model i am not modeling anything else in the generator i am not modeling the excitation system i am not modeling the saliency nothing so the generator here what we are going to consider is simply represented every generator is represented like this this is the internal emf okay and this is the reactants and this is the terminal voltage this is the model we are talking about clear so now every generator is supplied by its prime mover and remember in the grid all these generators are operating in parallel so they are all synchronized they are all synchronized clear so once we synchronize them then these synchronous machines must operate in synchronism that means no single generator should either, can either speed up or speed down it has to run at the synchronous speed you know that from your study of alternators so this equation swing equation is the same for every generator so you take the corresponding mechanical input of the generator and the electrical output of the generator that is equal to the accelerating power and this is the swing equation this is the swing equation clear now if it is a single generator connected to an infinite bus i can use one expression for the electrical power output pe is equal to v1 v2 sin delta 1 2 by x i am done with it right but then when i have if you take this case for example here there is a a power going through this bus this line and this line right so when we consider many lines a generator may be you know sharing its electrical power and passing transferring its electrical power more, over more than one line and in each of the line i can write this expression to where it is connected so if i take a single generator i would actually get sigma pe the sigma pe and that would be sigma i'll say v i v j okay v i v j right so let us just see again now i'll just show you a simple case in the multi machine what we can do okay okay so let us take one generator of a multi machine system i'm just showing one of them so it may have it may be connected to some other buses right and this will be connected to the mechanical turbine so this is p mechanical and here i have p electrical so the p electrical is not it will be equal to the power flowing in this line plus the power flowing in this line plus the power flowing in this line and on a simplified basis each of these powers i can write it as vi vj i is the generator bus vj is this bus sin delta ij by x ij okay so we can calculate the total output of the generator the power output of the generator and the accelerating equation is still the same pa is still equal to the mechanical power minus the electrical power and the swing equation i consider will still be this md square delta by dt square i would still consider the same swing equation only difference now is that i have to solve for the swing equation of all the generators i have to solve for the swing equation of all the generators clear and i have to so once we calculate the swing equation i i find out 
what is delta and omega that is what you get from the solution of the swing equation now this delta and omega will have, uh, definitely if delta changes again the electrical power outputs will also change so i have to again calculate the electrical power output before going to the next iteration next iteration right so i want you to understand this logic now let us just see one more okay so what how exactly would the swing look like if i take the frequency of the generators okay let us say this is the nominal frequency say 50 hertz so we we study theoretically that you know all the generators in synchronism must run at synchronous speed so that means all their outputs must correspond to 50 hertz right but it won't be exactly 50 hertz because you know there will be some dynamics involved they're all after all differential equations so in the normal case in the normal case what would happen is it would be around this something like this the frequency like it won't be at 50 hertz this would be for one generator and uh, then another generator it could be like this so you see it's not as if they're all running at 50 hertz no slight variation but then there is a band threshold so the control is exercised such that these frequency variations fall within a band now who determines the brand the grid code any country grid code tells you how much should be the variation what is the variation permitted so this is what it looks like in steady state we call this a steady state so don't there's nothing like an absolute steady state in power system because it's very dynamic so small variations will be there these are permitted and each of the machines will be going on like this right now suppose a fault occurs what can happen is i'm just showing for one of the generators it may swing more and then it will come down right and uh, another generator if i take another generator that may go like this and come down clear this is also stable what is happening here what is happening here is that you know the angles are swinging because of the fault but eventually they settle down eventually they settle down now let's see if i can have any other uh, possibility so uh, whether other possibilities are there let's just check it out so what can happen is this okay let me get back to my pen yeah Yes. So after a fault, this is a nominal, okay, not zero. This is a nominal. This is one possibility. Right. So this kind of a response, nowadays, this is not there. This used to be there in earlier manual controls where the swing could go up, come down in the first swing and then go up. But now when the system becomes unstable, it just goes up. So what we will check for is this, whether after increasing for some time, the angle comes down. If it comes down, we say the system is stable, right? This is called as first swing stability. Now comes, comes down for which generator? It comes down for all the generators. It comes down for all the generators, right? So what we do is, we simulate, we simulate the multi-machine system. That means we solve for the swing equation of all the machines and observe how the delta varies. So if the delta is able to come down fine, or you know, it may even sometimes go and settle at another new steady state, that is also fine, or whether it goes up. So how much time do I simulate? Normally five seconds is more than enough. If it becomes unstable, it will become unstable in five seconds. So normally whenever we do a simulation, 
uh, for a multi machine system, when I present the equations, you'll see that it will take a lot of computation time. Okay, so whenever I simulate for the multi machine system, we normally simulate for five seconds. And I observe whether uh, in the five seconds, uh, you know, the angles, it goes up and it, uh, you know, whether it is able to come down. If it is able to do that, then we say the system will be stable. Now, even if one generator goes out of step, in, in a matter of time, all the generators will go out of step. So is, supposing you're studying a 50 machine system, even if one of the machines is going out of step, you say the system is unstable, you can't operate. Clear? You have to remove that machine from operation. Now, if you remove that machine from operation, you don't know how the load will be shared, etc. So we conclude that it will be unstable. And how many simulations will we do? As I told you, this concept of stability is dependent on the location of the fault, the type of fault, etc. So in a multi-machine system, we have to see which are the critical faults and simulate for them and find out the worst case scenario. Clear. Now, before I present the equations, I want to show you, I want to explain one more thing. See, normally, when the system becomes unstable, what happens is a group of machines will accelerate and another group of machines will decelerate. This is what normally happens when instability sets in, right? So these group of machines, these group of machines are called as coherent machines. Normally they will be geographically located close by. Geographically they will be located close by, right? So in a multi-machine system, generally, it breaks up into it breaks up into two groups two coherent groups and the difference in between them will start widening what this practically means is a group of machines will accelerate and a group of machines will decelerate and i have told in my earlier lectures that every machine is equipped with an under frequency relay and an over frequency relay so these relays will trip the generators and it will lead to a blackout. So before that happens, we have to take some control measure. I told you the control measure could be in the form of load shedding, could be in the form of generator shedding, could even be in an extreme case, eye landing a part of the grid and so on. Clear? I hope what I have discussed is uh, clear now. So let's just summarize and so that you understand the mathematics I'm going to present. So this is most of this is qualitative. So quantitative equations we will see. Every machine, the accelerating power is mechanical input minus electrical output. And the swing equation for every machine is md square delta by dt square. So what should I do? I have to, I, I, I have the initial values. I have the initial angles. I have the initial omega will be zero because everything will be in steady state. I will have the initial voltages because in, to substitute VI, VJ, I need the voltages. So all this we will know. So from the initial condition, I start the iterations. So let us assume that the initial is at time T equal to zero. I start the iterations. Okay. Now, so I solve for the swing equation, calculate the new value of delta and omega. Then again, this delta will change the electrical power output, PE will change. If you remember, we did the same thing in the single machine in finite bus case. Every time we solved, you know, if you remember in modified Eulers, Range Kuta, everywhere we had PE is equal to V1, V2 sine delta by X. So we keep, we had an updated value of delta, we substituted in that and again recalculated the accelerating power. Clear? Clear. Same thing we will do here. So again, we solve for uh, the accelerating power, then use that to again solve the swing equation, so on and so forth. We go in time forward, iterating. And we get predict. This is a simulation. We predict what is the response. We predict what is the response. And when a fault occurs, 
most often a group of generators will swing together. We say they swing together. And this group of generators, they are called as coherent machines. So you, it will split into two coherent groups. It will split into two coherent groups. So now let us see uh, mathematically how we are going to solve the multi-machine case. The same assumptions we make as we made for the single machine, we assume the mechanical power input is a constant. Why so? Because the mechanical power comes from the turbine. So they'll have a high time constant. Whereas I am interested in five seconds, six seconds after the fault. Okay, so for this short duration, we can assume that the turbine output, which is the input to the generator is a constant. So we assume that the mechanical power inputs to the generators are all constant. And we neglect transmission line resistance and synchronous machine resistance. Easy, easy model, right? Because then I can have a very simple expression for the active power V1, V2 sine delta by X if I neglect the resistance. Remember I told you, this will give you a pessimistic result. That means your actual result will be better than what you are predicting which is fine, right? Pessimistic results are always acceptable. Then damping winding is neglected because that would increase the modeling complexity because I have to model the dynamics of the damper winding. Okay, so we will neglect that. And synchronous machines are modeled as constant voltage sources behind transient reactants. So I told you how we would uh, model it So what, what, what is the meaning of this? So the synchronous machine is modeled as a constant voltage source. This is the terminal and this is the transient reactance and this is the constant voltage source. So I model the synchronous machine as a constant voltage source behind a transient reactance. Why transient reactance? because the subtransient period is too small. So in all transient stability studies, the X we use is XD prime. That is the transient reactance. If you take the steady state reactance, you may get wrong answer. That is the direct access reactance because uh, that is high, right? So it will give you wrong indications of the fault current. So you have to choose the transient reactance. And the uh, voltage regulating loop is ignored. We don't take into the dynamics of the AVR, automatic voltage regulator. You can do it. See, we can model the saliency of the machine. We can model the exciter. We can model the AVR. We can model the turbine dynamics, everything. That will make the model more and more complicated. So you will have for every machine, you may end up with 10 differential equations. Now we have only two for the second order differential equation. I'll have two first order equations. If I model in detail, I may have 10, 12. So here we will not do that. We'll, so we are doing all this. Loads are represented as constant admittances. So what do I mean by this? See, I have a load at a bus. Okay, PL. So normally you will, this load you will represent as PL plus JQL. So now what I would do is I would convert it into an equivalent okay so this is some bus number i so the power this is what you are familiar with you use this in load flows so in load flows all the load buses are represented with the power they take pl plus jql now this pl plus jql i convert it into an equivalent admittance right? And I assume the rotor speed to be a constant. So I don't model that dynamics. So now let us see what happens in a multi-mission power system undergoing a disturbance. Okay. So first I have this set of equations. So this you see I have taken from minus infinity to zero. That means steady state. 
So I assume that my system is operating in steady state. So that's why we are taking from minus infinity to zero. So the, it is described by this. The network is the steady state network. So in single machine infinite bus also, I told you that you have a pre-fault network, a network during the fault and a post-fault network. The network during the fault and pre-fault will definitely be different. The post-fault network could be different too. If you have some line outage, then the network configuration changes. So therefore we have, this is pre-fault. So this is pre-fault. Then this is the dynamics during the fault. Remember your accelerating power has a X and X will depend on the network. X will depend on the network. We saw in the single machine infinite case when the fault occurs, what is the impedance seen? Transfer impedance between the buses. So F2 is the network, F2 is determined by the network during the fault, okay? So from, so we are assuming the fault occurs at zero and is cleared at TCE, clearing, time of clearing, TCE is time of clearing. Then after the fault is cleared, then this is the post fault network. This is the post fault network from TCE to infinity. So do I need, so we are essentially going to solve for these equations. The pre-fault anyway, we know it's steady state during the fault and post fault to determine the stability. How do I determine the stability? I observe the swing of all the machines. Some may go more. So this is stable. Now I find suddenly one machine goes like this, then the system has become unstable. Clear? So we solve for these equations. We'll see what is F1, F2, F3, and then observe the swing and then determine the stability. So you see here, I have represented the multi-machine case. Now, normally in load flow, when I model the network, this is my transmission network. That is all the lines, lines, transformers, etc. And these are all the loads at various buses. I have M loads, I have M loads, and I have N generators. I have totally N generators. Clear. So to solve the multi-machine system itself, there are many ways. I'm going to present one commonly used method, right? So now what I have this V1, V2, Vn, these are, these are the terminal buses. So when you do a load flow study, you, you are not bothered about the internal angle of the generator. I am only bothered about the terminal voltages. So in your load flow and state estimation, we solve for the terminal voltages. And what do I do with the generator? Generator is represented by PG plus JQG. Every generator. Remember your load flows? So PGI is the injected power. PLI is the power uh, delivered. And the difference is the injector, total injected power PI into the network. And we use that for the load flow equation. Clear? Now, when I want to assess the transient stability, I am interested in the swing angle, that is the internal angle of the generators, that is your delta. So what we do in this method is, I introduce additional buses, one, two, three, n buses, right? And what is there here? So the, how did we model the synchronous machine in transient stability? As a voltage source behind the transient reactants. So this is my terminal voltage. This is my terminal voltage, right? So this is the transient uh, reactance of the generator. And this is the internal bus voltage. This is the internal bus voltage E1, delta 1, E2, delta 2. Clear? So we, we look at this. So this is the modification we do to the network. This is the modification we do to the network. So this is how, this is the, I would say the circuit equivalent model for the network. Only difference here is this, these are all dynamic. We will represent this by dynamic equations, by the swing equation. Okay. So this is how first you change your network to this manner, in this manner. Next, what are all these loads? If you see here, these loads, huh? I have put it as YL1. 
YL2, YL3. Whereas this will normally be given as PL1 plus JQL1. This is the load you would have. This is the data you would have. I now, I now convert that P to an equivalent admittance. We will see how this is done. So step by step, we will study the solution of the multi uh, machine uh, swing equation. First step, all system data is converted to a common base because you have different generators and the generator impedances will all be in the generator base. And so we convert everything to a common base. You know how to do it. You have studied in power system analysis and you know how to do it. Now I perform a pre-fault load flow. Please remember in the load flow, I am interested only in the terminal voltage. I'm interested only in the terminal voltage. So what do I do with this uh, uh, pre-fault voltage? I evaluate the voltage at all the external buses. That means, External buses means uh, the terminal buses. So using the pre-fault voltage, the loads are converted into equivalent admittance. So remember the figure I showed you. How do I convert? So I know the, the load is specified by its power, PLI plus JQLI. So the equivalent admittance means what? What is the value of R and L? And I know the voltage. What is this voltage? This is the voltage you've got from the load flow. So if I, if this voltage is the bus voltage, what value of R and L will consume the same power? Clear? That's the meaning of an equivalent load. So here, this model of the load is called as the power model. So I'm modeling the load as a power modeling the load by what power it draws, right? And this model is called as the impedance model, constant impedance model. This is called as the constant power model. So I convert the power model to impedance model using this equation. So what does this mean? This value of YLI, this value of admittance, when connected at the bus where here, see here, yeah, any bus, Okay, so this value of admittance, this value of admittance for a voltage of VLI will consume the same power PLI plus JQLI. That's the mean. Okay, I hope it is clear. So what we do first, I do the pre-fault load flow. I have the voltages of all the buses. That is what the load flow gives you. You can use any of the methods, newton raphson gauss CDL, pass decoupled, anything, and then convert the loads to equivalent admittances. Next, I calculate the internal voltage, right? So what will be the internal voltage? This is the terminal voltage, okay? Plus the drop, plus the drop. So I am going to get the angle here. This angle will be with respect to the terminal voltage. This angle delta I will be with respect to the terminal voltage, right? So I have EI at an angle of delta I dash, and that's equal to VI plus JXDI dash. And then what is the current I? That will be the complex generation. So you know PGI plus JQGI, we have that data. So the conjugate of that divided by VI. So the current. You know, SI is equal to VI into II conjugate. You know this. Therefore, II will be SI conjugate by magnitude of II will be this, right? So I calculate the angle. I calculate the angle. Please note, this is the angle of EI with respect to VI because I have taken only the magnitude of VI. I have not taken the angle of VI. So in your load flow, you all your angles are with respect to the slack bus. Here, all your angles are with respect to the slack bus. Here, I am not taking the angle from the load flow. I am taking only the magnitude. So this angle which I am getting here for the internal voltage is the angle with respect to the terminal voltage of that generator. Right. Now, from the load flow, if the angle of VI is beta I, 
then the angle of EI, I, you can easily get it with respect to the common reference will be delta I dash plus beta. What, what does it mean? You see, this is my reference angle for angle. Now this is VI. So this angle is say, let us say beta. I would get this angle beta from load flow. Okay, then now I have EI and this angle is what I'm getting delta I dash. So delta I dash is the angle of EI with respect to VI. Therefore, the angle of EI with respect to the reference is delta I dash plus beta I. So I do this for all the generators. So at the end of it, what do I have? I have the internal voltages of all the generators. I have the internal voltages of all the generators. And the angle is with, with respect to a common reference, which is your slack bus. Next, the bus, so for load flow, remember, I don't consider the generator impedance. But now I again form, formulate the Y bus, taking the equal, just see this figure. Okay, now say this is a bus. So this equivalent admittance is, is a shunt element at this bus, right? And this bus may be same as two, let us say this is two only. This is two. So this load is connected to two. So if I see the bus number two, I have the generator reactants connected here and I have the equivalent load also connected. All these are not considered when we form the bus admittance matrix for load flow. Because there I will be considering only the transmission network. And the loads are all modeled as power loads, PL plus JQL. And generator internal impedance, I don't even model because I'm not even interested. So after the load flow, what you do? You update the Y bus, form a new Y bus to include the shunt load admittance, YLI, which is the equivalent of the load power and additional nodes you create to represent the generator internal nodes. So I showed you in the diagram, see here what we have done. We have created additional nodes, one, two, N, right? So what is connected to this node? The generator internal EMF and on the other side, you have the impedance connected between, impedance of the generator connected between this new node and this. So what will happen if you originally have, whatever nodes you have, if I originally have N nodes, now, and if there are the N generators, I will add N. See, let us say I have the data, for a 137 bus. Out of this 137 buses, I in, I'm just giving you some arbitrary thing. I have 50 generators, okay? I have 50 generators for 137. So now what I will do, I'll have, I have the original 137 buses, which are all the uh, external buses. Now I will add new 50 buses. So I will now totally have 187 buses. Right. So what is this 50? This 50 is the new nodes, new buses I have introduced to accommodate the generator internal reactor, internal EMF. Okay. So that's what we do. Okay. So um, you do that. Next, Y bus corresponding to the faulted network is formed. So I told you the network during the fault and network post fault all are different. So first we do during the fault, right? And then normally the transient stability analysis is done using three-phase faults. I told you three-phase faults are the most severe and most critical. So we assess the stability normally by simulating three-phase faults, right? So how do I get the Y bus during the fault is obtained by setting the elements of the row and column corresponding to the faulted bus to zero. So you have formed Y bus. Okay, now let us say, I am going to consider a three phase fault at bus K. Okay, remove this row and column and form a new Y bus. So the that K is the faulted bus where a three phase short circuit occurs, right? Then you also form the post fault Y bus. So I need to form three Y buses, 
for the external network for pre fault during fault and post fault apart from this for the transient stability when i solve for the swing i have to form the y bus by converting all the loads to admittances and also by including generator internal buses so lot of all this can be done stat, uh, statically they are not dynamic y bus is not going to vary dynamically okay so you can it, there is no the impedance is fixed so once you know the particular type of fault before you start the simulation you can form the y bus for the pre fault network y bus for the for network during fault for the post fault network and for all these three cases the y bus with the uh, loads converted to admittances and with the generator internal buses so everything can be formed before you start the iterations all these will not vary they are only different from fault to fault but for a given fault they are all fixed so next i have the admittance form of the network equations is given by so here they remember this y bus is, is including generator bus okay including generator buses now what has happened all the loads i have converted into passive elements right and so the injection normally how do you take ii you take ii is igi minus ili that is the injected voltage at any bus is equal to igi minus ili that's how you would take now these are all converted into admittances and i have i have absorbed these admittances into the bus admittance matrix so i i now have the injections only due to the generators that is what this means since all loads are converted into passive admittances current injections are present only at the n internal nodes remember i have added n new internal nodes so now what i will do this i vector i partition it into in and zero what is this in this corresponds to the injections at the n internal nodes hmm, what will that be so for any 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 node it will be si conjugate okay divided by vi that will be the current injection and at all the other non generator nodes it will be zero because all the loads also have become passive clear so what i do now see the current vector i have partition in and zero i also partition suitably the admittance matrix so this will be this will correspond to nn so you see here this is the internal voltage which we calculate from the terminal voltage i have already given you the equation see here this equation yeah using this equation i calculate the internal voltage and then this are the terminal remaining terminal voltages at all the original buses original external buses of the system and i partition the y bus also suitably so i can write two equations from this you can see in matrix form in is equal to y1 into en y1 is also a matrix en is a vector y1 into en plus y2 into vt other one is zero is equal to y3 into en plus y4 into vt i can write this so let's write it i write it like this in is equal to y1 into en plus y2 into vt and zero is equal to v3 into en plus y4 into vt so from this second equation i can write vt remember these are all matrices they are on, they are not numbers so vt will be minus y4 inverse because it's a matrix it's inverse don't make the mistake of writing as 1 by y4 it's not a number y4 inverse y3 into en now i take this vt and substitute here i get in is equal to y1 minus y2 y4 inverse into y3 into en so this is normally denoted by y hat and this is called as the reduced admittance matrix so i have reduced the admittance matrix so what we what am i doing now i am going to eliminate all this and i am only going to retain the currents at the n internal buses at the n internal buses 
Okay, so why do I do it? I can calculate the electrical power output of the buses. PGI is equal to EI into IIJ conjugate, right? So we X, I, 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 we know. So I have to take into account. So we, if I have a generator, now I know EI. I know EI and it may be co connected to many terminal, many terminal uh, buses. So this could be, I'm just saying some uh, v, VA and VB, VC, something. So I have to, uh, the total power will be flowing through all these. And this is the power flowing between this and the shunt between this and the reference node. So PGI is EI squared GII. So this is from the uh, equation I got from the reduced admittance matrix plus J is equal to one to N not equal to I equal to I is this EI EJ the internal EMFs. So this, this, this will be another generator EA, EB, EC wherever it is connected. So BIJ dash hat. So this is the element from the reduced bus admittance matrix. So I have Y hat. I have this, right? This will be N by N. So in the example I gave you, I had 137 and 15, out of this 137, I had 50 generators. So I make the total number of buses becomes 187. Now I reduce this to 50. So this will be 50 by 50 for the example I have taken. So I calculate what is the active power generated, right? Why do I need it? I need it for the swing equation. Mi, this is for generator I. D squared delta I by dt squared is equal to PMI, mechanical power of generator I and the electrical power output, which is got from this equation. Okay. So I calculate PGI and I solve for the swing equation. How many equations will I have? I have N. So this equation will be there for all the N generators, right? So I have N second order differential equation. So this is second order differential equation. So that will be 2N first order differential equation. 2N first order differential equations. So the N second order differential equations can be decomposed into 2N first order differential equations, which you can solve by using any of the numerical method. And just like in your single machine in finite bus uh, case, here also you should use the appropriate Y bus. During the fault, you should use the faulted network configuration. Post fault, you should use the post fault network configuration. Clear? So this is how you solve for the multi machine case. So you see, it is huge number of equations. If you have 50 generators, if you have 50 generators, you will have 100 differential equations. That's not very easy to solve. It will take a lot of computation time. It will take a lot of computation time. So in the method I have presented, it's called as the reduced order method for multi-machine stability. We have reduced the order. Today, because computing is fast, 